Good afternoon, everyone. Most people think they know what diplomats do. And most people are absolutely wrong. Uh, they think we're riding around on camels and we're enjoying gahwa. They think we're uh, running around with the Secretary of State whispering secret policy recommendations into his or her ear. They think that we're collecting information for our government. They think that uh, we're running around with the royal family and having a great time. They think we're uh, just out there yucking it up with the cultural uh, set and pretending that we're Barry White. But in reality, it's much, much different. Most people are wrong, as I said, about what they think a diplomat does. My name is Joey Hood. I'm the Consul General of the United States of America in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia. And my idea worth sharing is that diplomats' lives are a lot less glamorous and a lot more meaningful than you think. Let me begin with a quote from Nicholas Kraslov, author of America's Other Army. Quote, how can teaching effective governance, participating in nuclear negotiations, organizing a cultural event, reforming a child adoption system, selling weapons, recovering from a natural disaster, visiting prisoners, and fixing public relations problems all be part of the same profession? Welcome to the US Foreign Service. That diplomat you saw on the last slide collapsed over a table of takeout. He, uh, didn't, he wasn't uh, asleep. He, he fainted from exhaustion. Because all the things you saw in those slides and everything you heard about in this quote is true. Diplomats do all those things and a whole lot more. Let me explain why that is, drawing on some examples from my own 16-year journey with the US Department of State as well as some friends of mine who are very close to me. Diplomats, no matter what sovereign they serve, have an awful lot in common with each other. So the stories that you're about to hear, even if you're not an American, I am sure would ring true for diplomats from your countries as well. First and foremost, a diplomat represents his or her country and takes instructions from his or her government. And so for his or her government to be giving him the best uh, instructions possible, he needs to be providing information and analysis to that government as he can. So for example, who better to apprise Washington of what's going on in the Ukraine right now than American diplomats at our embassy in Kiev? It seems pretty logical. And why? Because for all the technical whiz-bangery that you see in the movies, there's no substitute for actually living in a country, learning its language, meeting its people, suffering through its traffic, attending its soccer games, relying on its hospitals, and living the life. I enjoy movies as much as you do. And I've often wondered why there has never been an accurate movie or television show about the life of diplomats. I mean, after all, the Air Force, Navy, Army, Marines, FBI, CIA, Department of Defense, Secret Service, White House, <laughs> and the list goes on. They all have movies and uh, TV shows made about them. Why not us? Personally, I believe it's because people wouldn't believe what our lives are really like. Yeah, they're unglamorous, but they're also really, really meaningful. Let me give you some examples. An American diplomat's highest priority is articulated to every chief of mission around the world in a letter from the president. And it says, your highest priority is to protect and promote the interests of Americans overseas. Also logical. That means that whether you're in Buenos Aires or Bujumbura, all the brains and brawn of the mighty US government that you're going to get very often is a US diplomat. So when you're born overseas, a diplomat's going to issue your birth certificate. When you get married, a diplomat will notarize your marriage certificate. When you get put in jail for some reason, a diplomat's going to visit you and make sure that you have food and medicine. And when you die, a diplomat will draw up and sign your death certificate. But often much more than that. 
For instance, take the case of my old friend who was serving many moons ago in Kabul, Afghanistan. And as always happens, just before a weekend, in the evening, he gets a phone call saying that a young woman who's from the United States has died in Herat, which is about 600 miles from the capital. So he finds a car and a driver, and he sets off on the day and a half journey to get there. He arrives in the late afternoon, and he starts going about the things that one does in a death case, meeting with doctors, meeting with the police, to try to figure out what happened, was there any wrongdoing, and what do we need to do next? So after he does all that, he goes to the hospital, and by now the sun has set. And he gets to the morgue, and he finds out where's the electricity. There is no electricity. So with flashlights in teeth and hands, he and some of the women's, some of the woman's friends managed to get her put into a body bag and then tie her to the roof of the car, and then off they go to Kabul. Doesn't sound very glamorous, but they had to do it somehow. And he gets back to Kabul and he says, uh, well, I need to do the very hard work of informing her family and getting her body ready for repatriation back to the United States. And, and he does all of this, as diplomats do all around the world every day. For diplomats, death cases usually rank just about zero on the glamour scale, but uh, pretty high on the meaningfulness scale. And when my friend recounted that story to me, it reminded me of a case I dealt with myself in a small, impoverished country that, fortunately, this case did not end in death. But again, it was just before a weekend, and it was in the early evening, because that's the only time you get these calls. A, uh, uh, an airport official said, we have this American, she's really sick, and she needs to get sent out quickly for medical attention that we just can't give her here. And she uh, needs four units of blood in order to go on a commercial airliner, and her blood type is unfindable in this country. What can you do? I said, I don't know. So I went to the embassy nurse. I said, do we have anybody that has this blood type? She said, yes, we have two people, a military attache and the ambassador, the ambassador being my boss. So I walk into his room, his office, and I knock, and I say, sir, there's an American. She needs four units of blood, and it's your blood type. Doesn't even look up from the computer. He says, tell the nurse I'll be there in 10 minutes. Great. So two units from the military attache, two units from the ambassador, and the lady's on her way. Now, it's not every day that diplomats are asked to give blood to their fellow countrymen, but it's nice to know that when we are asked to do so, we're ready and we're willing. In fact, so ready that we don't even have to look up from the computer because we know that's what needs to be done. But some of our most meaningful work comes when we reunite American parents with their children. One night, a friend of mine got a call from a woman in the United States saying that her children had been kidnapped from her by their father seven years prior, even though she had legal custody of the children in California. And for seven years, she had been sending Christmas cards and Valentine's cards and birthday cards and letters to the embassy, hoping that the embassy could find these children and somehow keep that connection. Well, my friend said, I've never had a case like this before. I don't know if I can help you at all, but I'll try. So she threw herself into it, and within a few days, she had some pretty good leads on where the family might be. So with the help of the police, she got the family uh, convoked to family court. The judge heard the case, and it moved really fast, and she made a decision. The woman who had legal custody in California would be given custody of the children in that country. But our diplomat friend says, well, wait a minute. Uh, the woman's actually not here. She'll be here in a few days, so what do we do in the meantime? And the judge says, no problem. I'll give them to you. And our friend says, well, wait a minute. I'm an American diplomat. Our rules say I can't take custody of anyone. The judge said, well, in that case, I have to give them back to the father. So our friend did what any of you would have done. She said, to heck with the rules. Give me the kids. So off they go with this woman they've never met before, this American diplomat, and they go off to her home, and they have no clue what's going on. Here this American diplomat is talking about this mother who wants them uh, back in her life so much that she was willing to go through all of this. And the kids are saying, but we've never heard really anything good about this mother. Are you sure? So our diplomat takes the file of Christmas cards and Valentine's cards and 
seven years worth, and over the weekend, they pour through all of these things, and the kids rediscover their mother. So when she finally arrived, the the reunion was magical. The kids were happy. The mother was over the moon. They got on the plane together and presumably lived happily ever after. But no movie, no book deal, no glamour. And despite all that, this friend who tells this story chokes up every single time she tells it. As heartwarming as it can be, though, to help our fellow citizens in need, most diplomatic daring do is done with foreigners, not with fellow Americans. And one of our most important engagements in the world every single day is deciding who is qualified to travel to the United States. It's difficult work, but we issue every year more than 9 million visas around the world to people to travel to the United States and get to know our country a little bit better. We interview, organize, and put together in every other way over half a million exchange programs for people all around the world. So they get to know us better and we get to know them better. We facilitate more than $54 billion a year in new export deals. That's a lot of jobs back in America. And all of these achievements are about making connections. Connections between people and between institutions. Such as when in Qatar, I facilitated connections between high schools in the United States and not in the areas that you would expect, and high schools in Qatar. So here were people, students, getting to know each other from these countries for the very first time. I also helped launch Virtual Embassy Tehran, which was the first portal in Persian and English that would facilitate communication between the Iranian people and the US government for the first time in over 30 years. Thanks to these tools, people could reach out and talk to each other again. But sometimes diplomats do an awful lot of good, not by making connections, but by saying no. Such as when an old lady came to my visa window in a small, poor country, and um, she says, uh, please don't give me a visa. I said, what? She said, please don't give me a visa. The last time you gave me a visa, I went to the United States. My son, who's just behind me, he took my passport. He made me clean his house, took care of his rotten children, and I couldn't leave for over a year. So don't give me a visa. I said, okay. I stiffened my spine, and I looked at the lady, and I said, loud enough for her son to hear. And I said, madam, I'm sorry, but I cannot give you a visa today. You're denied. And she smiled sheepishly, and I smiled back at her happy that our complicity would save her from a fate she didn't deserve. Not everyone, of course, is as grateful for our decisions. A presidential candidate in the United States in 2011, for example, said, career diplomats all too often may not be making decisions or giving advice to the administration that's in the best interest of our country. In another country, at an Independence Day speech, a head of state bellowed that I, was engaging in countless hostile activities against the hospitable people and government of his country, both personally and covertly. On Reddit one time, they had an Ask Me Anything session with an American diplomat. And the nature of the comments that came from that session led one of the bloggers to observe four years of 21st century statecraft, and for the American public, our diplomats might as well be from Mars. Well, all told, there's about 15,000 of us Martians in the U.S. Foreign Service. Many many of us have been killed in the line of duty over the past 50 years, including seven ambassadors. And our family members are right in the thick of things with us. In all but 18 of the more than 250 embassies, consulates, and offices where we work around the world, in all but 18 of those, our families go with us. So think about what that means. Hi, honey, I'm home. Guess what? We're moving to Ulaanbaatar. Hey, kids, it's going to be great in Ouagadougou. You're going to enjoy Guayaquil. And after that, we're going to Guangzhou. So these families are 100% part of your diplomatic life. 
And those cities are a far cry from Paris and Geneva and Vienna, all the places people think about for such a highfalutin career as diplomacy. We do have our fleeting moments of glamour, such as here in the eastern province where I've become known for supporting certain local soccer clubs. And this led one of my Saudi friends to say, are your diplomatic colleagues jealous of how famous you are? I said, no, <laughs> not at all, because they know that 95% of your work in the diplomatic life is not highfalutin at all. It's not uh, about celebrity status. It's less often about staring down a dictator over human rights abuses, and more, much more often about dealing with the parasites in your gut from eating way too much takeout. It's less about walking the walls of power with the Secretary of State, and a lot more about getting lost in a new city every two or three years, and having to make new friends every couple of years, even when you're tired enough that you want to fall asleep over your table of takeout. No, the diplomatic life is not glamorous at all. But, and, and you know, nobody makes movies about us, nobody thanks us for our service back home, and nobody gives us uh, discounts at the checkout counter at the grocery store. But that's okay, because we don't join for the glamour. We join for me, we join for purpose, and we join hoping to make those connections between people that will one day make a difference for our nations. I'm Joey Hood, and that's my idea worth sharing. Thank you.